On your marks, runners, get set, go, and register now for the Daytona Beach Half Marathon. Hi, and welcome to Volusia Magazine. I'm Amber Patterson. Early bird registration for the Daytona Beach Half Marathon will save you some money. And Independence Day celebrations are on the horizon, and many people will plan to decorate the sky with fireworks. So, Volusia County Fire Safety has some safety firework tips for you to keep in mind. Volusia Here and Now reporter Kendra Lee tells us how you can give back to your community by becoming a volunteer. And Community Information Director Dave Byron will be joined in the studio by Beach Safety Ocean Rescue Director Mark Swanson. Those segments, news, and more coming right up on Volusia Magazine. Stay tuned. It's hot outside, and it's going to be even hotter on the 4th of July. As Americans prepare to celebrate Independence Day, Volusia County Fire Rescue urges residents to celebrate safely. In 2013, eight Americans died, and more than 11,000 were injured by fireworks. Sparklers and rockets accounted for more than 40% of those injuries. Personal use of fireworks is illegal in Florida, except for certain agricultural and mining purposes. Basically, if it explodes or flies, it's illegal. What is legal are the things that you could buy at some of the stores and things that just emit showers or sparklers. But again, like we said earlier, those are very dangerous and we get just as many injuries with them because of the, the intensity of the, the heat and the fire that comes out of those devices. If you're buying fireworks to burn at a backyard party, you're breaking the law. Florida law classifies it as a first-degree misdemeanor, which means those convicted could face up to a year in prison, a $1,000 fine, and court costs. Consumers who decide to purchase legal fireworks are urged to follow these tips from Volusia County Fire Rescue. One of the concerns we have is the dryness of the environment. Um, the drought index is up right now for us, so we're asking folks when they use the uh, legal fireworks that they just take several precautions. Number one, make sure that you're in a safe flat area, a hard surface if you're going to light the product. If it needs to be uh, lit on the ground, make sure that you set it on the ground and you stay 30 feet away from it. Have one person that's designated as the igniter. They light it, keep the children back and everybody enjoy it. Then whenever the uh, firework is over, let's go ahead and put that in a either a bucket of water or let's douse it, make sure it's out completely, and then you can pick up all the debris afterwards. Personal fireworks are also banned on Volusia County beaches where they can leave a mess and can frighten nesting sea turtles and cause birds to abandon their nests. For more information, log on to volusia.org and select fire safety. Area runners need to mark February 7th on their calendars. That's the date of the Daytona Beach Half Marathon, and early bird registration opens July 1st. Volusia County Government and Daytona International Speedway have partnered to return the popular running event to Daytona Beach. Sponsored by Florida Hospital and Brown and & Brown Insurance, the Daytona Beach Half Marathon features a breathtaking course that takes runners from the historic asphalt of Daytona International Speedway to International Speedway Boulevard, leading to a panoramic view of the Atlantic Ocean atop the International Speedway High Rise Bridge to the sparkling white hard packed sand of Daytona Beach, and then back to the start finish line inside the iconic motorsports facility. Early bird pricing for the half marathon is $75 from July 1st through November 30th. After that, registration is $85 until January 31st. From February 1st until race morning, late registration pricing will be $95. The Daytona Beach Half Marathon began in 2008, and County Manager Jim Deneen believes the event planned for 2016 will have a lasting and positive impact on tourism in the area. Uh, we believe this is going to do uh, wonders for the community in terms of raising our profile. We also believe that over time, what people will see is this is a good place not only to infuse our economy in terms of the race, 
but I think people will see how wonderful it is here, and I think because of the weather, the beautiful environment we have here, we'll see a lot of these people uh, translate into vacationers here in, in Volusia County. No place else will have this kind of, we'll call it hook, where you can, you know, run around one, the world's most famous racetrack to the world's most famous beach and finish under the world's most famous uh, finish line. Uh, no one else is going to have that kind of a venue. And where else can you run in that kind of comfort and warmth in February? We're going to be the race in the winter to come and run. For more information and to register for the Daytona Beach Half Marathon, you can visit DaytonaBeachHalf.com. Passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport remained steady during May, staying almost even with last year. During the month, 60,356 passengers flew in or out of the county-operated airport when compared with 60,551 passengers last May. For the 12 months ending May 31st, passenger traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport increased 2% from 620,572 passengers last year to 634,902 this year. Well, it's um, always hard to predict, but if you go back to 2009, our traffic has gone up 50% since 2009. We've had some down months, but if you, if you run the numbers through a chart, you're going to see there's been a steady increase in traffic at Daytona Beach International Airport for the last five years or so. So we think overall that's going to continue. Earlier this year, JetBlue Airways announced new nonstop service between Daytona Beach and New York City beginning early next year. The new nonstop flight is planned to commence in early February and would provide daily Airbus A320 service between Daytona Beach and John F. K. International Airport. For more information about Daytona Beach International Airport, you can go online to flydaytonafirst.com. Giving back can make a big impact, especially when it comes to volunteering in your local community. Volusia Here and Now reporter Kendra Lee has more about getting involved in this week's Here and Now report. If you're looking for ways to positively impact your community, volunteering is a great way to do so. Volusia County offers a wide variety of unique volunteer opportunities throughout the county. If you like to get up close with nature, the Lyonia Environmental Center in Deltona may be for you. We have everything you can think of. We are an education facility, so we are always looking for volunteers to help with our education programs. We have school field trips, we have scout programs, we offer public programs on the weekends. Sandra Falcon is the manager of Lyonia Environmental Center and says the volunteer opportunities range from animals to leading nature hikes. We look for volunteers to help us with animal husbandry, cleaning the cages, feeding the animals, checking on their welfare, making sure they're healthy. Um, we also look for volunteers to help us with hikes in the preserve, with gardening. We have a beautiful butterfly garden. Being an environmental center, we try to grow our own plants to replant in that butterfly garden. So we're always looking for people that can help us with trimming, seeding, planting, replanting again, monitoring that as well. If you're looking for a way to get engaged, 4-H is a great place to do it. We definitely have a lot of animals here to learn how to take care of. <laughs> the Volusia County 4-H program is always looking for volunteers. Extension agent Laura Cash says agriculture is the heart of 4-H. There are a number of other volunteer opportunities. People in the community that would like to give back to our youth by teaching workshops on things that they're interested in, such as sewing or cooking. I welcome those people. It's all about life skills and it's all about youth development and turning our kids into the citizens of the future and what we want them to be. That's what 4-H is about and that's what our volunteers, we're all working together to accomplish that and it really does take a community to raise kids. Volunteer Valerie Hammond says by volunteering with 4-H, you get back more than you give. Get involved. There's nothing, it, it gives back daily, absolutely. You know, you've got to take the time, you've got to have the time, but the positive and the reward gives so much back. There's, there's nothing like it. Advisory boards are a great way for citizens to get involved in important issues that affect Volusia County. 
These groups research and make recommendations to the County Council on a variety of topics, including growth management, services for children and families, licensing for contractors, tourism marketing, funding for cultural organizations, and many more. May I help you? The libraries are a fantastic way to get engaged and make an impact. Library of Services utilizes volunteers from age 13 to over 90 to help with a wide range of duties, including shelving materials, check-in materials, managing the phones, and programming assistance. So, if you have the time and the desire to volunteer, Volusia County has an opportunity for every age, location, and time commitment. For more information and to get involved in various volunteer programs, visit volusia.org front slash volunteer. For Volusia Here Now, I'm Kendra Lee. Let's join health correspondent Stephanie Strong for this report from the Volusia County Health Department. Florida is the place to be the hit the pool to stay cool. It's also important for parents to be aware of pool safety. Florida leads the country in toddler drownings. Drowning prevention advocates join forces at the Port Orange Family YMCA to raise awareness to water safety. Always make sure you're with your children when you're swimming or when they're swimming. Make sure that there's always somebody there with them, obviously with an adult, but we always also teach the children, always swim with a friend. Never swim by yourself. Try to swim in groups. Make sure everyone knows, you know, safe places, pools. We tell them to stay away from the retention ponds, the big fences going around the outside. They're there for a reason, not to go in there and go swimming. Florida leads the country in drowning deaths of children one to four, and here in Volusia County, we had five such drownings last year. Our goal is to have zero children drown in Volusia County. Pool time can be a lot of fun, but it's important to remember some safety tips to prevent a summer day from turning into a tragedy. The Florida Department of Health has a campaign called Waterproof Florida, and it stresses three layers of protection. Layer one is supervision. Having a dedicated adult that is responsible for actively watching any children near water and never assume that, that adult needs to be clear as to who it is and they should never assume that someone else is watching the children even if there's other adults there or at the pool. Layer two is barriers. That's a fence around every pool with a self-closing gate and ensuring that that fence is in good condition and the gate's in good condition and working. And layer three is emergency preparedness. Learning CPR, so if you have children, if you have a pool, or you have children that are going to be around a pool or water, learning CPR, and in the event that there is an accident, calling 911 immediately. One of the other barriers I want to mention today that is very important to prevent drowning and near drowning incidents is to teach children to swim. Uh, in response to the incidents of drowning and near drowning victims that were seen at Halifax Health Medical Center, uh, Safe Kids back in 1996 began to offer swim scholarships to children to help them learn how to swim. We also have found over the years that children uh, that come from economically disadvantaged families are four times more likely to drown uh, than children that come from families that have better economic resources. So we have been providing since the 1996 scholarships to children that come from low-income families that they might have the opportunity to receive swim lessons from certified swim instructors. The YMCA began the concept of swim lessons more than a hundred years ago and to this day we continue to teach swim lessons and water safety to more children than any other organization. Locally, each summer, we teach more than 3,000 children how to be safe around water. Well, we can only teach the kids, as Steve said, if they have access. So this year, we're offering free community swim days at our seven centers or six centers across the county. One of the most important and basic things to remember when you come to the beach, always swim in front of an open lifeguard tower. If you bring small children to the beach, um, make sure that you know where they're at at all times. Um, a lot of people underestimate the power of a rip current, and a lot of people think if they're a good swimmer um, that, that they can get themselves out of a rip current. But 
even the strongest of swimmers um, get caught in rip currents. So it's extremely important to swim in front of an open lifeguard tower. Um, a lot of times they know you're in a rip current before, before you do. Again, the Florida Department of Health's Waterproof Florida campaign focuses on the three layers of protection, supervision, barriers, and emergency preparedness serve as a safety net keeping a child safe and helping to prevent a drowning. The Florida Department of Health strongly recommends multiple barriers to help ensure safety and using layers of protection to help prevent drowning. Explore waterproofflorida.com to learn the steps you can take to secure your pool and protect Florida's children. Remember, pool safety is everyone's responsibility. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Stephanie Strong, Public Information Officer for the Florida Department of Health in Volusia County. As always, if you have any questions about this or any other health-related issues, you can log on to volusiahealth.com. So it's time to head into the studio to join our very own Community Information Director, Dave Byron, with his guest, Beach Safety Ocean Rescue Director, Mark Swanson. Thanks, Amber, and hi, everyone. The busy July 4th weekend is right around the corner and that means thousands of people will flock to the beach for fun in the sun in what is the biggest holiday weekend of the summer. Volusia County's Beach Safety Ocean Rescue, they'll be out in full force staffing the lifeguard towers and doing everything they can to keep beachgoers safe. If you're going to the beach, there are some common sense things you should do to keep you and your loved ones safe. Beach safety is our subject today with our studio guest, Beach Safety Ocean Rescue Director, Mark Swanson. Mark, how are you doing today? Good, Dave, how are you? I'm doing great. Hey, July 4th, uh, it's kind of like uh, the peak of summer season, yes, no matter where you are. And we're here. Yeah, <laughs> so what do you expect? Uh, large crowds, Mark? We expect large crowds. Um, hopefully the weather's gonna be nice and uh, everybody will flock to the beach for the holiday weekend. And uh, you'll be at uh, full peak staff uh, on July 4th. We will be at full staff. Um, we've we plan on uh, staffing between 70 and 80 lifeguard towers. Uh huh. And Mark, how do you go about determining where those towers are located? We have a priority list um, based on where the crowds are going to be, and uh -huh. uh, we prioritize those towers. And uh, it changes daily, or it can change uh, with a with a different weekend. So. Um, we prioritize those and those are the towers we staff first. I know uh, there's been uh, some confusion about, you know, how many towers you have on the beach and you actually have more towers than you staff on any given day because you kind of store them up by the uh, seawall. We do. Uh, we, we, the, the towers that are, that, are, that are functional that day are down by water's edge. Right. And then we have some other towers uh, in close location that if we have to move towers, if we have to to put another person down there, we can do it very quickly. And generally speaking, uh, Mark, uh, what do you shoot for in terms of hours in which those towers are staffed? We staff them. They, they open up at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning and they're staffed until, um, until the beach closes. And uh, the, 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 the towers that are in the parks, uh, the surveyor towers, we staff those for extended right. hours because of the people in the parks. Mark, uh, I guess if you're talking about uh, beach safety, there's probably no better a piece of advice to give people that are going to the beach and that is is when they're going uh, locate near one of those towers uh, that is staffed by a lifeguard. Absolutely we strongly encourage people to swim in front of a manned lifeguard tower. And when they get to the beach uh, it's always a good idea to go up and maybe just uh, say hello and uh, any unusual conditions. No, right. no problem with that. All our towers are beach ambassadors and uh, and there's, uh, there's, there's charts on the back of the towers that display rip current conditions. Um, the lifeguard's name is on the tower, the high and low tide is listed on there, and the water temperature. So, but any other questions other than that, if they have questions they want to ask, then feel free to ask the lifeguard. You mentioned rip currents. Uh, for those folks out there, maybe they're visiting, don't know what a rip current is, give us kind of a layman's description. It's, it's a large amount of water that comes in from the, from the, from the, west, from the east side and into the west, and uh, it brings a lot of current in with it. And it comes uh -huh. in, it turns out and goes back out, and as it goes out, it creates a a whirlpool type effect that actually can pull you out away. Right. And uh, your lifeguards are, are very uh, well trained to be able to spot these rip currents. So certainly if, a fo if folks are going to the beach, they should just ask that lifeguard if there is any rip current activity there. Absolutely. Our lifeguards are, are trained to recognize rip currents in those areas. And um, they have whistles and they have flags. And if you get into that one of those areas, they're going to flag you out or they're going to whistle you out. Um, and by all means, if you get caught in a rip current, you need to raise your hand like you're, 
you're asking right. for help and they're going to come in and rescue you. What your job is, as I understand it, is those lifeguards is you try to prevent people from getting uh, in trouble before they actually get in trouble. Absolutely. You know, we don't we don't just track rescues. We also tra track preventative actions. Right. And what I mean by preventative actions is those that are each of those times that um, that they have to blow the whistle and get somebody out of the area if they have to wave somebody out with their people's flag. But um, we track those ones as well. So if, in fact, you're going to the beach and you should be uh, caught in a rip current, there are some, again, some common sense things that you can do if you have your wits about you to get out of a rip current safely. Absolutely. You know, we want you to stay calm, relax, and swim parallel with the shore. Once you right. swim parallel with the shore, that current uh, pulling you out will break, and then you'll be fine to be able to swim into the, into the shoreline. Generally speaking, Mark, if you're, if you're pulled out, how far do you have to swim parallel before you're actually out of a rip current? It depends on the, the severity of the current, depends on the wind speed those days, but you may have to swim 10 or 15 feet to one side of where you're going to be pulled in or break. Um, but okay. 10 or 15 feet is not really a... No, it's really not. And you just, you just relax and swim parallel with the shore until it breaks. You're going to feel it when it breaks. Right. Mark, uh, the other thing of it is, is of course, uh, you know, on parts of Volusia County beaches, um, you know, we do allow... Uh, traffic. I know that uh, you're going to manage uh, the cars on the beach uh, very carefully. Yes. Um, w what pieces of advice do you have for people regarding? Well, you uh, know, there's, if, if you're, con you're concerned with bringing your children into the area where there's driving, then there's obviously alternative uh, areas that you can go on the beach to, to go where there is no vehicles allowed. However, we have to set up a traffic lane every day in the areas that vehicles traffic is allowed. And, um, you know, we take that very seriously. Right. And that traffic lane is not going to be set up, and we're not going to let cars on the beach until we can establish a safe traffic lane. Um, that traffic lane has to be moved many times during the day as the tide changes. Right. So um, if there's ever a time that we can't create a traffic lane that is safe, we will not allow cars on the beach. And it's it's uh, one-way traffic in each direction when you estab establish that traffic correct. lane, correct? Correct. Uh, we do have some certain areas that... Uh, like from ISB to uh, and behind the lifeguard station, it's one way. Right. So um, check with the toll guards. You know, when you when you right. come down to the beach, they'll be able to give you a map. They'll give you some information of what areas are drivable and which ways are one ways and which way are two ways. And given the uh, size of the crowds that you expect over the July 4th weekend, um, you're almost going to direct people into the nearest parking space so you can get as many vehicles on the beach as we possible. We are. You know, parking's a premium on the holiday weekends and we use what they call event style parking so people will come down and we'll actually direct them where they need to park. We're trying to cut down on the amount of cruising that takes place on the beach. We want people to come down and park their vehicles, be able to take their equipment out of there and and uh, have a good time down on the beach. And when you set up, uh, you don't set up on the side of your vehicle. You have to set up in the front of your vehicle. On the front of the rear or the rear right. of the vehicle. We don't want you to set up in between the vehicles because that could, um, if somebody could be driving down the beach and thinking that there's no car parked there, that's right. an open parking space, and they can whip their car into there. And if you have your equipment set up, you risk the chance of getting run over. Right. Now, let's remind everyone the speed limit on the beach is what, 5 miles an speed hour? Speed limit is 10 miles an 10 hour on miles the beach, an hour, okay. and it is strictly enforced. We have some speed signs down there that remind people what their speed is, and we also have laser radars, and we strictly enforce that speed on the beach. Windows down, lights on, right? Windows down, lights on, uh, no texting while you're driving. Um, stay focused when you're in the traffic lane. Always be cognizant of somebody stepping in front of you. Right. Um, observe the traffic lanes and, and be safe while you're down there. And, Mark, uh, obviously uh, drinking and driving is uh, prohibited anywhere. And uh, you don't allow alcohol on the beach. We do not allow alcohol on the beach. We do not allow glass on the beach. So right. um, if you're caught with alcohol on the beach, there is actually an ordinance violation. It will be issued a citation. And um, uh, it's just unsafe. It's unsafe to drink drink before you're driving on the beach. And it's also unsafe to drink before you're going into the ocean. So yeah. we don't. We, we strongly encourage no alcohol on the beach. And, of course, Mark, uh, again, for people that uh, may not be from Florida, uh, you know, they come down here from uh, other parts of the country, not used to the intensity of the sun here. Uh, the sun can be pretty intense, and you can get a pretty bad burn. Absolutely. We strongly encourage people to use sunblock, um, a minimum of a, of a 50 SPF, um, and apply it often. If you go in the ocean and swim, make sure when you come out of the ocean you reapply. If you're out there playing games or running around on the beach and you're sweating, right. apply it again, you know, once you dry off from sweating, um, but reapply it often. And just because the sun's out doesn't mean that right. you're not going to get burnt. So on those uh, days that it's overcast, you still need to wear your sunscreen. Mark, what about uh, if you're staying, let's say, in a hotel or a beachfront condo, and let's say that you know that you're going to be on the beach uh, multiple days. Let's say you've 
you know, going to be there for the whole weekend, and you may have one of those large tents or mm -hmm. other uh, types of beach uh, furniture. W what happens at the end of the day? At the end of the day, we want you to take everything with you. Leave yeah. nothing on the beach other than your footprints. Take your uh, recreational equipment with you, because if not, our night officers go around, they tag equipment on the beach, and the next day it's actually picked up and it's disposed of. So um, we have an ordinance that says that no beach furniture is left on the beach overnight, and uh, we strictly enforce that as well. Why is that a problem, Mark? There's people that run and walk on the beach at night, and it becomes an obstacle for them. They could mm -hmm. actually hurt themselves by running into a, a tent set up on the beach, or they could trip over something uh, that's set up on the beach. And, you know, the beach is open to pedestrians all the time. So right. uh, there's pedestrians down there all the time, and we do that for their safety. Mark, last question. Uh, obviously, fireworks are associated with July 4th, and uh, that can be a significant problem, and they're not allowed on the beach, right? That's correct. Fireworks are not permitted on the beach, and uh, it is a, a, it's a very uh, difficult thing for us to enforce down there with the amount of people that are down there, but we strongly encourage people that the fireworks that are, that are approved to buy in Walmart are the ones that just sparklers and things like that. We're okay with those, but anything that creates a report or a boom is uh, not allowed on the beach. And, of course, uh, I guess it goes without saying, Mark, if you're going to be at the beach, uh, pick up after yourself. Absolutely. Because I've seen the beach uh, after July 4th, and uh, it's kind of sad sometimes. Right, it when is. You, you know, and that's everybody's beach, and, you know, it's, it's a beach for people to come down and enjoy, and we want to keep it looking nice and all the time. If, if folks out there want to get more information about beach safety or beach conditions or that sort of thing, I know you have some ways that people they can, can get it. They can go on volusiacounty.org. Again, uh, it's under beaches. Um, we also have a beach safety app that you can download wherever you download your apps, and it gives you all the information about ramps that are open and, and uh, towers that are open and, and uh, the tide and, and the water temperature. All those things are on the beach app. And uh, one more thing I wanted to add is we do have those rescue bracelets down there. Uh, thanks for um, reminding me. Uh, it's an acronym, R-E-S-Q, and it, re it stands for Unite Everybody Safely and Quickly. Uh, we've taken it to a de different step this year as we've uh, given them to the hotel owners and they're passing them out to the kids. But um, it's a yellow bracelet, very little visible. bracelet that wear right here. It goes right around their arm. It has their parents' cell phone number on it. If they do become detached from their parents uh, anytime during that weekend, or whether they're on hotel property or on beach property, um, we find them. We can actually call that phone number. It gets them united back again. It's very stressful for a child when they're lost. It's very stressful for the beach safety officers trying to get them reunited again. So um, we initiated this program, and uh, we've taken it a step further with the hotels and. Uh, and we're going to get as many of those out there as we can. Great service, no question yeah. about it. Well, again, Mark, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, uh, let's have a great and successful and safe uh, July 4th weekend. Thank you, Dave. Want everybody to come down, have a great time, and come back again. Our guest today, Mark Swanson. He's the director of Volusia County's Beach Safety Ocean Rescue. And with that, Amber, we'll go back to you. Thanks, Dave, and thank you for watching Volusia Magazine. If you have any questions about the show, you can always feel free to give us a call at any of the numbers you see listed here, or you can log on to volusia.org and then click on the News tab at the top of the screen to find us. Incidentally, you can find the County Council's meeting calendar there too. In fact, you can use volusia.org to find out about meeting dates, workshops, topics of interest, activities, and how you can become involved. And we hope you won't forget to listen to Volusia Today. That's Volusia County Government's weekly public radio broadcast. Volusia Today airs every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Sunday mornings on the local radio stations you see on your screen. For Volusia Magazine, I'm Amber Patterson. Have a wonderful evening.